something is moving in the fog. Who's there? Something not quite human. Who is that? In Halloween, John Carpenter created a night of absolute fear. Now, he has conjured an evil so intense, not even the dawn can drive it away. The Fog, a study in unrelenting terror. Rated R. And if we could not get sued for using that intro TV spot, that would be amazing. Please, please don't grass us up. So, <laughs> hi, we're welcome back to Horror Court Trash Ever, the show that discusses all the masterpieces and trash pieces of genre cinema. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. And we are well into our 31 days of horror now. We certainly are. We are, in fact, six days into it, I believe. And uh, today we're talking about a good film for a change. After... Uh, Discussing the likes of Feeders, Alien 2 and Showgirls to start the podcast off. We're now delving into good film territory, so don't hate us for it, please. Well, now's the masterpiece part of the masterpieces yes. and trash to pieces. Before so we start... to happen. Yeah, I mean, before we start, I do want to give a shout-out to the movie So Bad They're Good Facebook group and podcast. Uh, they've been... Nothing but really good to us uh, these last few weeks, giving us shout-outs on their podcast, uh, letting us post this podcast on their group, um, and a little message to one of their hosts. We are men. Um, John, uh, gender is a construct, guys, but uh, one of their hosts wanted to know if we're men or women. We, we are men. Um, yes. We don't have boobs, we do have dicks, um, yeah. just to make you aware. <laughs> You've got to listen to their pod, their sorcerer's podcast episode to uh to get that. But uh, anyway, uh yeah, no, they've they've covered some uh, some gems on their podcast. Go give them a listen. Um, but yeah, I mean, they they were talking about doing a collaboration one day, and we we'd totally be down for that. Yeah, I hope they're still interested after us talking about good films for a. Uh, and after this, what I found out that we're not women now. We might be we might yeah. be less of an appeal. Yes, yeah. Anyway, so. Speaking of uh, gender, the film we're talking about today is Gay Heaven. There are so many slay queens in this film. And, and not even just the women in the film. The, the cast in general is incredible. We are talking about The Fog. The Fog. John Carpenter's The Fog from 1980. I love this film. It is one of my favourite John Carpenter films. Uh, one of my favourite ghost films. It's just... A lot of perfection in my eyes. It's um, yeah. There's just there's so much to love about it. I think uh, it it's really intense. It shows off John Carpenter's ability to create unbearable suspense. Um, yeah, a lot of great things about it. And what's your thoughts about it, Chris? Yeah, I like the fog. I mean, in terms of John Carpenter, it's definitely up there. Um, it's probably not my favorite. Um. But yeah, really enjoy it. Fun film. It's a fun film to watch. It's a perfect film for this time of year, I think. It's it's a it, it's like it was made for Halloween. It's so atmospheric. It you know, it's the sort of film you want to be watching this time of the year with the lights off, the pumpkin going, you know. It's always been on my watch list anyway. Um I first watched this at quite a young age and uh it it was on TV one night and I uh watched it in my room. And it had an impact on me because it was just so scary. Just, uh, yeah, a lot of scares in this one. You um, first watched it recently. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't watch it. I, I didn't watch it when I was younger. Um, I, I'd, I'd known of it. Um, I'd, I'd known about the remake as well, uh, which really got me interested Ugh. in watching this one. Yeah. But it, it didn't really come about until... Uh, I met you that we watched it together. Yeah, the uh, remake, we don't need to watch that. And, uh, it's got a um, Smallville guy in it, what's his name? Tom Welling. Yeah. It's got Samuel Blair in it. It's got Samuel Blair. Blair. It is horrendous. It is just CGI trash. Mm. And obviously, John Carpenter's got a producing credit because, as he said, he's happy for anyone to remake his films and put his name on them as long as he gets a paycheck. Good old John Carpenter. There we are. <laughs> I, I love him. He's he is my favourite director. Um He's up there for me. He he's just he can do anything. He you know, he's showed off how he's good at making comedies, sci fi films, horror films. He even made an Alvis film, which I wasn't the biggest fan of, but you know it's it just wasn't it just didn't interest me, but it's not saying it's a bad film. Um but it you know, 
it, it was just it was well made still and that's the thing no matter how many of his films you know even his bad ones they're still well made um yeah, he's got more good films than he has bad yeah. films. Yeah, and absolutely. I, he's got a bit of the the Wes Cravens about him. When he gets it right, it's top notch. It's ten out of ten masterpieces. But sometimes he gets it really wrong. Yeah, Ghost of Mars. <laughs> Ghost of Mars. Yeah, we need to be careful what we say about Ghost of Mars. That has a big cult cool following. Yeah, a little bit of backlash. I when, uh, yeah, I posted a review of uh, Ghost of Mars on Horror Court Trash Over, and all you guys hated me for it. <laughs> no one was happy with me. I've never got so many angry comments about a review before. Apparently, people love Ghosts of Mars. I don't <laughs> see it myself, but you know, each, yeah, you, each to their own. You do you, hun. Um, do you do you. But in in a similar fashion with The Fog, I've never got so many positive comments about a review. I mean, even recently, you know, posting the announcement about this episode, so many of you guys love it. And I I love that. I I love that this film is getting the recognition it deserves. This is, you know, it it has got a massive court following. It's only got a 6.8 on IMDb, which I assumed it may have been a little underrated. But no, when I first initially posted the review, that's probably the most likes we've ever got on any post on horror court trash ever it's like i said last week um and i'll touch on it a little more this week is there's a i think for a lot of people there's a nostalgia attached to it they either caught it you know on late night tv or it's one of the films that their parents allowed them to watch because it's not a gruesome film no it's uh john carpenter was going for a, a pg rating yes so it's not bloody it's not gory it's not sweary um, it it's very atmospheric, um, but I think it's a very um, one that you would you you could show to children. I know it got an R rating eventually, um, and I don't know what it's rated here in the UK. It's uh, fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. That surprises me because I do feel like it's probably one of his more accessible films for for a younger audience. And I feel that he was going for that. Yeah, it's very psychological, though. Um, I, I think that's what scared me so much, is the whole psychological aspect of it. There's a lot of fantastic editing in this film where you've got something going on in one scene, something going on in another, but they switch between them so fast that it just creates the tension from that pace um, and just builds it up so much. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, I love the whole wave of horror directors trying to get the films rated PG. I mean, <laughs> it failed and worked for Toby Hooper. I mean, he got uh, Poltergeist rated PG, but <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he was shocked that uh, he didn't get a PG. Unless you were Steven Spielberg, uh, you know, you couldn't get a real horror film, a PG rating. Can you believe Toby Hooper wanted um, a PG for Texas Chainsaw Massacre? I, I, I can't, I uh, can't. <laughs> Maybe he was just too good <laughs> at the time. <laughs> just too good. It made it too scary. This film had a budget of $1 million. Yeah, yeah. So he... Um, yeah, I, I can see that. It's a small-scale film. Yeah, he tried to keep the budget down as much as possible. Like, in the scenes with the radio station with uh, Adrian Barbeau, uh, the music that was played is just royalty-free jazz music because it was a little more affordable than using rock songs. Yes. Yeah, and you know this was inspired by the Trollenberg Terror, the old mm. British. I didn't horror know. film. No, is that? It's uh, basically a similar plot line: creatures hiding in uh, the mist and oh, taking see. people down. I know that he was also influenced by a visit to uh, Stonehenge. Yes. So very very British influences on this film. Yeah. Then. So shall we? Uh... I just actually before we start because um I think I think it might come up during but if we could just touch on the cast of this film yes one of my favorite aspects of the film yeah overall, this is um just an amazing cast this and... is like John Carpenter's greatest hits this is um you know these are actors that he I mean bar Hal Holbrook I don't think she's Hal Holbrook in Amy Cows or Janet Lee so no, um, but not bar Lee. those two you know these are actors and actresses that he has used um before but this is the most he's had in one film together of his favourites. Yeah, it's it's an ensemble piece. I, I would call it definitely an ensemble it's, piece. It's uh, Adrian Barbeau, Jamie Lee Curtis, her mother Janet Lee, uh, Nancy Loomis, now Nancy Keys, I believe, uh, Tom Atkins, Charles Cyphers, and Hal Holbrook. I, 
those are the main actors. Everyone, everyone in this film does a fantastic job. Yeah, and but those are the big names in it. And you it's... get someone like John Houseman who who plays, and obviously when we go through the film, you'll know who he is. Um, the captain at the begin, oh, uh, Captain Birdseye, I called him. Excuse <laughs> me, that just came out there. Um, the sort of sailor at the beginning telling the the stories to the kids. You know, that's John Houseman. He was an Oscar winner. You know, he won in 1974 for a supporting role in The Paper Chase. So this is top class actors here, you know, not just unknowns. Yeah, absolutely. So this film is about an unearthly fog that rolls into a small coastal town um, exactly 100 years after a ship mysteriously dis- disappeared in its waters. And amongst that fog is some terrifying ghost pirates. Ghost pirates, yes. And we start the film with a quote from Edgar Allan Poe saying, is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream. And then we are introduced to a ghost story. Would you like to touch on that? Well, yeah, I I did just explain that I called him Captain Birdseye. I'm I'm not sure if that translates outside the UK. (laughs) Um, But he's he's a beardy sailor man, grey hair, grey beard, telling a, a ghost story. To some surprisingly interested kids. Yeah. <laughs> they uh, are uh, really fixated on this story. And it's about the town's history yes. and the uh, the yeah. boat that did go missing. And uh, this is kind of spliced in between uh, an introduction to Father Malone, who is a priest we'll get to know in this film. And uh, we get to see a cameo from John Carpenter, who is named Bennett after his college friend Ben Tramer, which some of you may recognise the name from Halloween. He was the poor soul that got <laughs> killed by accident in Halloween he's, too. He's got a surprisingly cult following, this Ben Tramer. Ben Tramer is very popular on the internet. Very popular. <laughs> poor Ben Tramer. <laughs> his pure white uh, Michael Myers man <laughs> hair. But um, this campfire, st- back to the campfire story, they... Um, they explain that uh, the Captain Birdseye explains to these kids that uh, when the fog returns to this uh, little coastal town, then the men beneath the sea will return for revenge on the people that caused their uh, ship to crash. Yes. So this this scene at the beginning was actually added in. Um, the the film ran for eighty minutes, um, before uh, they did some extra uh, shots. Um, John Carpenter didn't think 80 minutes was long enough for a full-length film, so quite a few scenes were added in, uh, including this one at the beginning as a, as a little introduction. Yeah, and uh, after this after the introduction scene, we get Adrian Barbeau, our first slay queen of the film. We do. Talking like uh, she's a porn star. She does. It's very um, sensual the way she talks when she's on the radio. Yeah, she sounds like one of the cock destroyers. Oh. <laughs> Bit of British culture there for anyone listening. Uh, that's not from the UK. Uh, our well-known social media personalities, the cock destroyers. Cock destroyers. Yes. Look them up and uh, you'll see how they sound like Adrian Barbeau in this film. Um, <laughs> but she was actually, she wasn't modelled after the cock destroyers. She was modelled after uh, 60s DJ Nightbird. Oh. Mm, apparently she used to speak like that. Okay, so, yeah. I think... I've been- Probably very similar. Yeah. Uh, Nightbird screams to me that she's the night radio woman. I, I, I believe so. I mean, it does what it says on the tin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm really struggling to talk um, today. I don't know where this going from. The British quote there. Does what, uh, this is our most British episode yet. This might be, <laughs> Captain Bird's Eye Cop Destroyers and it does what it says on the tin. It <laughs> does what it says on the tin. Everyone, everyone listening that's not from the UK she's going to turn off right now. <laughs> um, so this was Adrian Barbeau's first... Yes, as um, Stevie. ...foray into cinema... Oh, yeah. Really, really her first film? This was her first oh. feature length film. She'd previously starred in um, Maud, the TV series, uh, which was quite popular with B. Arthur. Mm. If anyone's aware of that, that was a sitcom that was. Uh, she'd originated the role of Rizzo on Broadway in Greece. Nice. And she'd previously been in John Carpenter's TV movie, uh, Someone's Watching Me. 
Oh, she was, and that was a great film. Yeah, yeah, really enjoyed that film. And I'm assuming that's where her and John Carpenter met. Yes. And eventually married right before this film was shot. They, yeah, they were married during this film. And this, this role was written specifically for Adrian Barbo. Yeah, we watched a documentary on this film uh, prior to watching the film today, and uh, Tommy Wallace, the star of the documentary, I had uh, no problem telling us about how uh, they originally, John Carpenter and Adrian Barbo wanted to have separate rooms and everything whilst on set, but they eventually gave up. Couldn't go that long about each other. Wow. How sweet. Honeymoon period, isn't it? Tommy Wallace seems like such a... What's the word for it? Well, I, I, how he came across on the documentary is that he felt he was didn't get enough credit for he, all the work he did. Tommy Wallace is the is the fog. So he was like, "Well, I did this, and I did that, and I did that, and I did that." I like, okay. So I was a ghost pirate. I yeah. created a graphic design. I, was I did like, this. I'm, I'm not denying it, Tommy Wallace. It's okay. <laughs> You're right. Uh, anyway, back to the film. I must have got it mixed up. It, it, the intro scene actually wasn't spliced between the church scene. That was introduced later on. Um, but the reason I got it mixed up is because we get a bit more on that story from the beginning um, when Father Malone uh, discovers a journal beyond the wall. A brick falls out the wall and he finds a journal of his grandfather, his great-grandfather, Patrick Malone, who was writing about that incident with the ship crashing and whatnot, back when it happened in uh, in 1800. And then after that, we are introduced to Nancy Loomis uh, because the town goes crazy. Uh, phones start ringing. Bottles start rattling. Uh, petrol station practically comes to life. And then car horns start beeping, waking her up. And as we know from Halloween, she hates a guy with a car and no sense of humour. That is very true. She hates ghosts with cars and no sense of humor in this film. So we 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 have this uh, scene, this this setup where the payphones are going crazy, and the the pe- what one moment I didn't really understand is that the petrol pump yeah. came out and started pouring petrol ev- everywhere, and you're there and you I'm waiting for an explosion. Yeah, but it's trying to keep it low budget. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm a bit like, so I'm sat there and I'm like, oh, it's going to explode in a minute. It's like, <laughs> and oh, it shit. Didn't. We've been introduced to a Ben Tramer, the was, sign of a fire. It's going to happen a again. Little, I was a little disappointed. I was like, well, when's this petrol station going to blow up? But, you know, from our research, we found out that it probably wasn't in the budget to blow up a petrol no. station. But uh, yeah, so this wakes up uh, Nancy Loomis, who plays Sandy. Uh, an assistant to Mrs. Williams, who's played by Janet Lee, who was the town mayor? She was the uh, woman in charge of the 100th anniversary things that would go to celebrations. The she strong the, businesswoman in she charge. Was, she was the chairwoman, so she was she was in charge of it all. But we don't get introduced to her until a bit later. Instead, we get introduced to Tom motherfucking Atkins. Here he is, the man himself. Yeah, minus moustache. He has no moustache. Minus moustache. He has no moustache in this film, which is a little disappointing, but he's not the usual Tom Atkins in this film. He's actually playing a serious role, um, which usually, in his other films, I mean, I'm sure he'll argue that he is trying to be serious in his other films, but it's not easy to take him seriously in those films. He's really camping over the top, and that's why everyone loves him so much. That's why he's so... Um, big within the genre, you know. Everyone expects a good old, over-the-top Tom Atkins performance. But uh, in this film, he plays Nick Castle, which was the name of the actor who plays Michael Myers in Halloween. Another nod to uh, yes. someone from John Carpenter's life. Yes, yeah. But uh, Tom Atkins, it, as Nick, is driving down this road and he picks up none other than my favourite actress, Jamie Lee Curtis, who is playing Elizabeth. In this film. Yeah, so Elizabeth's just like a hitchhiker. And um, she's... Um, I'm not sure what she's wearing. That outfit's a bit... Um, How dare you? <laughs> she's a little... She's had, she's had her hair cut since Halloween. And uh, there's sexual tension, isn't there, from the officer. Just a bit. He gives her a... It gives, she gives him a look when uh, she gets in the car. Like, oh. Yeah, wants to know if he's weird. Yeah. Happy that he says he is weird. Takes yeah. a drink from him. He's drink driving because he's Tom Atkins. Yeah. Drink driving, <laughs> yes. 
and uh, <laughs> no seatbelt. Uh, she she uh, explains that he's actually her thirteenth ride. Soon, that becomes quite literal. <laughs> That's very true. Um, the car window smashes as they're having a lovely chat, and uh, then we cut to Adrian Barbo playing Stevie, and she's in her lighthouse still talking dirty. And who does she get a call from? Oh, she gets a call from... Paul Lynn. Paul Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> Though we've stolen this Paul Lynn thing, to be fair. What did we steal it we from? We watched a YouTube video of Halloween. Oh, Brock guy... Stubbs. Yes. Brock Stubbs. Yes, the shout out to you. We've stolen this and we've memed it in real life. <laughs> and every time we see Charles Cypher on screen, we do an impression of Paul Lynn. I ain't doing it. This is a free look- podcast. No one ain't paying me for this. <laughs> So you ain't getting my Paul Lind impression for free. Well, we've already used a TV spot, so yeah, we're yeah, already getting sued for yeah, that. Yeah, so no one might actually listen to this now. Um, but yeah, so we love Charles Cypher. Yes. But do we love him in this film? Well, he's trying to, he's trying to flirt, <laughs> isn't he? It comes across really creepy, <laughs> he though. He does. But what I noticed, actually, throughout the film, because he, he calls up a few times trying to get in um, Adrian Barbeau's pants... Is that whenever he's trying to flirt, he sounds like Jack Nicholson. <laughs> sounds like he's doing a Jack Nicholson impression. No, he doesn't. He sounds like Ghostface from Scream. <laughs> he just sounds like him as well. But his sort of the way he talks, it's like he's trying to do a Jack Nicholson impression, but sounding like Ghostface. He does sound like Ghostface. <laughs> he does. Well, now we know what Jack Nicholson would sound like if he was playing Ghostface That'd be from Scream. Amazing. Well, I mean, we've got it with this film. So um, after a bit of. Uh, Small talk between Paul Lind and Stevie. We are introduced to some fishermen on a boat who are also listening to Stevie. And uh, they're getting a bit of a horn on over it. Yeah. they. Uh, well, one of them was like, oh, um, you know, I'd, I'd like, to, <laughs> like to have a go on that. And yeah. Basically. And they practically like, oh, call her a MILF before the MILF was invented. Yeah. Yeah. The original MILF. And um, what one of these... Uh, fisherman is Janet Lee's husband. Yeah, I could imagine. Is it the one sh- who says he's not happily married? I'm not that happily married. Maybe. If so, who the fuck does he think he what is? What an absolute dick. That's Janet Lee. Fuck you. You How should be grateful. You? How dare you? They weren't exactly models on that boat, were no, they? No, they weren't actually. <laughs> but um, yeah, they're out doing a fishing late at night and uh, start talking about Adrian Barbeau being a MILF. Um, then fog starts to surround the boat and uh, we get to see a ghost ship appear. Yes, yeah. Look, big old pirate ship comes out of the fog out and of nowhere. The cinematography in this scene is just mind-blowing. It's amazing. It is perfect for the atmosphere. Yeah, Do you absolutely. Agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just... Yeah, it's just perfection. Um, You, you know... John Carpenter is known as a master of suspense, and this film really does prove that. Um, as the scene goes on, uh, the boat is invaded by these pirates, these ghost pirates, who you could just see their silhouette, and that's what makes them so scary. It, it does give a sort of Michael Myers impression. I mean, of course, this was his big... This was his first... John Carpenter's first big screen horror film after Halloween. So, I mean, I think it would have been fresh in his mind that... People would be expecting to see more of the things. It was so successful so quickly. Um, you know, I think he was going for a few things to uh, give a little nods to that film, hoping that people will like it a bit more. Yeah, yeah. And I also think it plays into what I was saying earlier about him trying to get that PG rating. Yeah. It's, you know, if you just have a silhouette, you can make a silhouette look like a pirate. You know, you know it looks like a pirate. Mm. Um, you know what it's meant to be. You know that it's meant to be some form of ghost. And not seeing it, number one, you know, means... Well, budgetary-wise, you can just have some bloke in a costume. They don't have to put on makeup. You know, number two, it's it adds to the atmosphere. It's what you don't see. And then thirdly, you know, it doesn't make it gruesome. Do no. you know what I mean? But then we get a massacre from these pirates. And even though you don't really see a, a huge amount of blood or anything like that, 
the sound effects yeah. make it so much more effective. You don't see any blood, and, and I don't w- wish to keep going on about it, but, you know, the fact that it is someone gets a sword right through their chest yeah. and there's no blood whatsoever. I think there's a bit on the sword. Nothing over the top, but there is a yeah, bit on there. I, I didn't think I saw any. Yeah. You know, this, this ain't Kill Bill, you know, where blood's spurting everywhere. Um, it, it keeps it, you know... It's not a low key kill, you know. It's it's quite a good kill, you know. The sword goes through the chest, but it doesn't make it too gory and gruesome. No, and then another one, um, you know, they have hooks as well, uh, and then one of the fishermen's left, um, underneath the boat. I I, I don't know proper terms for boats. I'm not a boat expert. It's um, below deck. Below deck. He was below deck. Thanks. Below deck, and another pirate goes down to him, a very intense scene, and he gets it through the eyes with a sword. He does, actually, yeah. And he then does. we get some uh, post-sex Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis. It's uh, quite shocking. I mean, not quite shocking. I've not no proved myself, but um, it just comes out of nowhere. You're like, oh. Yeah, I think it's um, Jamie Lee Curtis breaking a horror stereotype that she was... Uh, at the centre of. Like, the fact that she survives this film, spoiler alert, and she had sex, wasn't a well-known thing in horror films those days. No, no. I mean, Halloween sort of started that craze. Um, it, it didn't start the, the slasher film, uh, but it started the slasher film craze. And one of the big things that came out of that was the virginal final girl. You know, she don't have sex. I mean, you know... Um, Laurie Strode is the quintessential virgin in that film. She is. She is. She's spot on. She's the stereotype. So it is It is a break away from that role to a certain degree. It is. And then they, uh, they have a little bit of small talk themselves. And they get a knock on the door. So uh, Tom Atkins goes to investigate. And this scene is terrifying. It's just... You can just see the silhouette again of the pirate standing at their door amongst the fog. And it's just not moving at all. And, you know, it looks like it's about to be the start of a home invasion film. And uh, Tom Atkins goes to answer the door. You see the uh, hook lifting up from the pirate. And the clock smashes, saving his life, essentially. And then... Just in the nick of time. Just in time. And then he opens the door and no one's there. And that is the introduction done. That is... Such an amazing introduction to a film. Like, that. I, I look at that whole opening sequence as just one big introduction to those characters. Because really, you find out a lot about them. Yeah. In a yeah, short amount of time. You do. You do. And, um, I mean, in a film with so many characters, and it's not the lengthiest film in the world, um, hence why they had to add to those 80 minutes you're not going to get real in-depth with every single character. So it's a nice little introduction. It's a good introduction to the story. We see the killers. We know what's going down. We know what's happening. You get your first kills, and they're they're good kills. I think, yeah, it's a good introduction to the film. So after this introduction, we are given some daylight and an introduction to Stevie's child, Andy. Andy. The very, very 70s looking child. Yeah. Like, he's wearing a parka for a start, of course. <laughs> he's wearing a parka. He's got that haircut. <laughs> he's got that Danny Torrance, Damien haircut. I, I mean, all the... Um, what, what's the kid? Tommy from Halloween. Tommy from Halloween and his friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, all have that 70s haircut. So here we are, 70s kid in a parka. You're definitely in a 70s horror film. Um, well, early 80s horror film. Maybe it's a little behind with the times there. Yeah, this it, must have been filmed in the 70s. Yeah, I think. But it's, it's, it's a small coastal town, you know. You might still be a bit behind with the fashion. Not quite in the uh, 80s yet. Well, he is playing around on a beach and he sees a coin on some rocks. And we get a few uh, cutaways with uh, the sea going over this... Um, over this coin and the next minute it turns into a plank of wood that says Dane Dane yes and this is when we're first given the incredible soundtrack scored by John Carpenter 
It's so atmospheric, but it fits this film so perfectly. It's a fantastic soundtrack, and it's quintessential John Carpenter. It's a yeah. simp soundtrack. It's really, really, really good. And I would probably say one of the best things about this film is that soundtrack. Soundtrack and cast, I think, are fantastic. When uh, when I saw John Carpenter live at uh, Warwick University, and he played The Fog... He played that soundtrack and he filled the room out of a smoke machine and it was just one of the best experiences. It was amazing. You, you need to see him live. I should, yeah. I should, actually. But um, back to the film. So Andy finds this piece of wood and he goes to visit his mother. And this is actually one of her only scenes that she actually shares with another character. Yes. On screen. Yeah, there's only actually two scenes that Stevie shares with uh, another character. This one with her son waking her up with this um, plank of wood. Yeah. And later on in the film when she finally meets the, you know, ghost pirates. Yeah. They're the only ones. She's completely isolated otherwise. And she's our lead character, really. Mm -hmm. She's the... I see her... I mean, she get Adrian Barbeau gets top billing uh, within the uh, the credits. And I, I would say she's our lead... Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. And fantastic yeah. performance as well. Yeah, yeah, really good, considering, you know, she had no experience of um, full-length cinema, cinematic features. Uh, really good. And it's that idea of her isolation in particular. And it's the isolation of the town, because it is a small coastal town, um, sort of out there, you know, no nowhere really near. It's that idea of isolation that runs throughout the whole of the film. Yeah, absolutely. And her kid wants her to buy him a stomach pounder and a Coke. What the fuck is a stomach pounder? I don't know. I'm assuming it's just a really, really big burger. But then she says he's not allowed it till after lunch. (laughs) So what, is he having that on top of lunch? What's that? Yeah... Wow, that's responsible parenting yeah, that's from probably not Adrian Barber. Too in depth on this one. So after this, um, we get introduced. Uh, well, we get some more of Nick and Elizabeth doing some investigating into the fisherman that went missing, um, and we're also introduced to Mrs. Williams, Janet Lee's Finally character. Finally, see Janet Lee, and she is serving outfits and hair. She is. She looks she incredible. Category is executive realness. Yeah. Strong businesswoman. She is. She means business. Yeah. But Sandy Nancy Loomis is so rude to her. Well, there's that first. Yeah, there's this little um, tit for tat with them, isn't it? Of, yeah. Y- y- they don't really like each other, but they they're getting on with it, sort of thing, which isn't really explored massively within the film. It's just uh, a couple of bits of dialogue. And Nancy Loomis always does a great job in playing a character that just she just can't be asked with life. Yeah, she and it's not the, the character isn't too far away from Annie in yeah. uh, in Halloween, so she she does it justice because she's good at that sort of role. And we get a bit of exposition, um, some really good exposition actually. This is really well written. Uh, the of course the fishermen, as we mentioned, um, some of them know Tom Atkins' character. And uh, of course, one of their, uh, one of their wives is Janet Lee. Um, so it gives a bit of depth to their characters and makes it a little better to know that they're not just characters that were just there to be killed off. They had a bit of meaning to their uh, existence within the film. I think as the story continues, and it's one of the bugbears I have with the film, and, and people did have with the film at the time is that potentially those three were filler victims. Yeah, but then I think this bit of exposition to say that, you know, one of them was actually one of these main characters' husband. Yeah. Adds a little more. But then, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But then the other two, it's like... "Mm." Because, I mean, if you look at it this way, if these characters didn't get killed, then they'd have nothing to investigate in this part and... Wouldn't really make them aware of the, the yeah. stakes of how high but they are. But you could have had that with just one bloke. I suppose. But after that, we are uh, we are given a visit to the church by Sandy and Mrs. Williams. And uh, we get reintroduced to Father Malone. 
And he's got this journal that he found at the start of the film and he starts reading it to Janet Lee and Nancy Loomis. And they're bored shitless. <laughs> they do look really bored. Um, and uh, just Nancy Loomis is just so pissed off that she has to listen to it. And um, then it cuts between that, as, as he's reading the story and explaining, um, you know, what's in this journal and what happened all those years ago, it cuts between that and Nick and Elizabeth exploring the boat that the fishermen were on that, that got murdered. The right words there. And um, as they're exploring this boat, there's a very effective jump scare. Did you get that noted down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the uh, the body jumps out at Jamie Lee. Yeah, so, I mean, first the cupboard opens, some things drop out of it, and uh, just as Jamie Lee Curtis is about to stand up, this dead body falls on her, and we see the aftermath of what happened to the guy who got his uh, eyes stabbed into. Yes, and and that's uh, that scene was also an extra scene that they filmed after the initial filming of the film, because uh, John Carpenter didn't think it was long enough, but also didn't think it was scary enough either. And we get a, to finish off the monologue from Father Malone, we get a great line about how the uh, Antonio Bay 100th birthday celebration is a travesty and how it's honouring murderers. Yes, yeah. So I'd I'd love the, um, because you you went from Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee investigating and Father Malone boring everyone with the journal, but it, it was a really effective way of, pushing the plot forward. Yeah. Um, but not just if you if you just sort of sat there and Father Malone was spewing out whatever he was spewing, we'd probably be just as bored as Janet and uh and Nancy were. Um sorry I, I never use character names, I always forget. So I always use uh actress and actors names. Um so I, I like the way that they they had those together and edited them in together. That was that was quite good. Yeah, and then um, we get taken back to uh, Stevie, who is about to tackle so many stairs. That lighthouse has the most amount of stairs I think I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, massive amount of stairs. And again, it's adding to the feeling of her isolation. Yeah. You know, um, to even get close to civilization, because she's locked away in this lighthouse for her radio show. Um, even to get anywhere near to isolation, she has to tackle those stairs first. Yeah, and then she, once she gets into the lighthouse, she puts this plank of wood that her son found on top of the uh, radio cassettes, and uh, it starts to leak. A bit of water starts coming out of it. It does. And uh, it goes into the radio, and it creates the... Oh, there's a loud motorbike outside. <laughs> it creates the... Um, oh, is it finished? Yeah? Yeah. Cool. So it creates the radio voice to become distorted and uh, before the plank of wood essentially explodes. Yeah, the, the creepy voice says something about an albatross. I ain't going to lie. I, I didn't really get the context or, or whatever. I think it was to do with the six P on the motorbikes back. Fuck's sake! <laughs> it, it things to do with the six people um, that caused the uh, the situation in the yeah. 1800s. Yeah. So, so what? So this plank of wood says Dane on it. We know that the the shipwrecked, the initial shipwrecked um, boat was called the Elizabeth Dane. It's a piece from that. Um, the gold coin turned into this piece of wood. So, you know, it's telling the story. The gold gets stolen. The ship is wrecked, and then where after it explodes, it says six must die. Yeah, yeah. So we we get that six people must die in order for these pirate ghosts to avenge what happened to them. Yeah, and then obviously with the wood setting on fire and whatnot. The fantastic effect created by Tommy Wallace, because he's a graphic designer. <laughs> In case you forgot, Tommy Wallace did a lot for this film. Um, but then, you know, this obviously causes a bit of concern with uh, Stevie, and she gets on the phone to Andy and makes him aware, you know, this plank of wood is possessed, yeah. essentially. <laughs> Not exact words, but uh, don't pick any cup off the beach. Yeah. So, and then we're introduced to Mrs. Corbett, one of my favourite characters on the film. I love the babysitter. Corbett? She's, uh, 
Yeah, that's her name. Is it? Yeah. Oh. I was mishearing that. L- lovely old babysitter lady. Yeah, yeah, lovely old lady. And don't uh, really do much in the film, but yeah, she doesn't do a lot. But you know, she's she's very likable. But um, her and Andy see the uh, fog approaching, and then we cut to one of the scenes that's most memorable for me when I first watched it when I was younger. Um, is a uh, doctor's office uh, mm-hmm. where. Nick and Elizabeth have took this corpse that they found on the boat and Nick's talking to this doctor outside of the room and uh, Elizabeth is just standing in the room and you can see behind her um, the corpse underneath a sheet on the table and it starts to move. Uh, The corpse puts his hand out, grabs a scalpel and then it's cutting away really fast and you just see him walking towards Elizabeth and then falling towards her. And I just remember watching that as a kid, being so scared, just not knowing what's going to happen next. Something that John Carpenter's amazing at creating. Well, it's pretty much a scene from Halloween, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it mirrors a, yeah. s- a specific scene from Halloween. Yeah, you've got Jamie Lee Curtis upset in the foreground, in the background, who a, a body that we presume to be dead rises... Comes at her with a knife, barely misses, you know, and um, she screams. <laughs> yeah. So it's so really that is that is taken directly from Halloween. Yeah. Fantastic scene. So it's though. a really good scene. Now I'm not saying it's not, um, but obviously, I've, I've seen Halloween. I sort of knew what was going to happen. So next up. We go to a uh, we go to the Antonio Bay birthday celebrations. They've started. Uh, we almost get a scene of Janet and Jamie Lee together uh, in the bar as they uh, as they all gather in there to discuss what's going on. Almost. Very almost. Almost, very close. Um, but yeah, and then it goes. It cuts to uh, Stevie talking with Nick for the first time um, about what's going on. And, uh, yeah, and then we get Charles Cyphers again, being creepy. Mm-hmm. He calls up the radio station after she's finished done talking to Nick. Um, but he's uh, telling her about the weather forecast. Because, I mean, I don't know if we mentioned previously, he is a weatherman. Um, so his job isn't just to uh, creep Adrian Barbo out. He oh, is, yeah, uh, I don't think we mentioned that. <laughs> he is there to tell some crank corner or something. <laughs> uh, so he does have a purpose, but not for long, because then these pirates show up at his house and he gets got. Yeah, well, he's at the weather station and he's talking about this fog and um, this. he's saying that the, the wind is going in one direction and the fog is going in the opposite direction. Like, How can that be? Um, but he's very sort of flippant about it. He's like, oh, whatever, you know, the fog's coming close. She obviously knows something's up. Uh, and they're on the phone together, and he's just like, oh, whatever, you know, still want to go out for dinner. And, <laughs> and all that, still being a bit of a perv. And then opens the door and, and gets a good old hook to the neck, doesn't he? Yeah, and obviously Stevie hears this on the phone, and she tries to get the police to call her, but then the fog destroys all the electricity in the phone lines. Is it the scene where he's wearing that horrendous sweater? Yeah, where he's dressed like Pamela Voorhees. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it makes him look about five stone heavier. And older. So. It, it was awful, that. Sorry, that's my image, is, is him. and he, he just makes him look really overweight. It's not very flattering at all. And I well, love Imagine Charles if Charles Sivers ever listens to this. He's so yeah. pissed off at you. Well, no, it's, I'm sure the sweater wasn't <laughs> his choice. It's not a nice sweater, sorry. After the phone lines and electricity are destroyed, then we get a, another death scene quite quickly, and it's poor Mrs. Cobritz, the babysitter. Yes, yeah. Um, another very intense scene. Yeah, it is actually. Yeah. Yeah, the, the fog starts uh, approaching their house. Uh, she gets Andy into the bedroom to protect himself, but then she gets murdered. And we have. Uh, Stevie on the radio shouting Andy get out of the house it's all very fast moving Uh, she gives the address out on air and then uh, the pirates make their way into the house start breaking down Andy's door but of course Tom Atkins being the hero he is makes it there just in time and saves Andy he does and uh, 
in a very heroic scene. Takes him out of there. Uh, they get into the car. Elizabeth tries to drive off, but the car's stuck. The pirates are approaching. And again, there's just so much suspense in this scene. And, you know, I mean, it's a horror trope. The car's not moving. You know, the villains are getting near to the car. You know what's going to happen. But in the moment when you're watching that scene, you know, it's so intense. And it's, it's made even better by the cinematography, by the music, you know. Perfection. Yeah, I, I think this scene is a heart. And, and the, the sort of moment where Charles Seif is killed is where the intensity really gets jacked up in this film. Um, and it, it really, you know, the, the danger is there. The fog has arrived and that's where you get your sort of fire. And it's, you would you say that's your sort of final scene? Qu- uh, scene qu- I, I'd say so. Like you have your intro and then it starts building, building. and then It's every- not a long film. I mean, no, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an hour not. and a half. And yeah. with how fast everything moves in this film, it doesn't even feel like an hour and a half. It just yeah. goes by very fast. So the moment that Charles Cipher is killed... You know, our lead knows that something definitely is up. Something definitely is going wrong. People are in danger. You know, she's on the radio. She knows that her son is in danger. There's that intense scene in the house. Then the old lady gets killed. Um, And then, you know, Tom Atkins, Jamie Lee to the rescue. And that's... And then that's when followed. The action finally yeah. sort of starts to happen. And of course, that's followed by when Stevie starts saying there's something in the fog on the radio. And a lot of the dialogue is what makes this film, you know, what also makes the film really suspenseful. You know, if it just seems like that of her screaming over the radio, there's something in the fog, yeah. you know, it alerts the other characters. And her inability to help, that's all she can do to yeah. help her son. And, and she explains, and, you know, for all she knows, her son's dead. So it's her panic and her upset at the fact that she's completely unable to save her son. Yeah. So other than screaming on the radio. You know, yeah. Which which in fact does save her son. Yeah. And uh, Mrs. Williams and Sandy they also hear this as well. So they uh, they make their way to the church because Stevie explains on the radio that the church is the safest place to go. Uh, from what she can see with where the fog's moving to. Um, so they all gather there, get to see Janet and Jamie Lee on screen together. Yeah, the first they don't really interact film. much, do they? Not a lot, but it's, it's nice to see. It's one of only two times. The only other time was in Halloween H2O, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, so we've got Jamie Lee Curtis, Janet Lee, uh, not Adrian Barbo, no, that's incorrect. Um, Nancy Loomis, Hal Holbrook and Tom Atkins all on screen together at the same time and they're gathered in this church and then begins our final final sequence. Yeah, so this is the moment where all, and you find you get it a lot in ensemble pieces is the finally that moment where all your characters that we've seen individually, and they've all interacted in between themselves but they all come together for the climax, you know, and particularly in sort of horror films, they all come together. This is, you know, in the church, apart from Adrian Barbeau. Yeah. Who was still isolated. And that, I think, is such a great part of this film, is, you know, I I know I keep going on about it, I'm sorry, but it it is my favourite, really one of my favourite parts of the film is how Adrian Barbeau's character is so alone in all of this, you know, and you really feel for her and that's why she's the lead. You know, everyone else is at the church. She's still there at the lighthouse. A lot of the shots in this film, whether she's driving um, or going down the steps at the lighthouse, um, a lot of the shots of the film and the visuals show this great landscape and it's a beautifully shot film and it's a beautiful location, but vast areas of ocean, vast areas of sky, completely empty. And I, I, I think 
you know, this this climax adds to that. Yeah, and it, it becomes more effective because then the fog starts to surround the lighthouse and you realise just how fucked she really is. Yeah, there is no one there to save her because they're all dealing with their own shit at the church. Yeah. And then, you know, at, at the church, we get some more exposition about as to why the pirates are there and then they break into the church in some of my favourite shots from the film where we just see the hands coming through the windows. Beautifully shot. I love, I love that imagery. It, yeah, it, it looks amazing. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. they pull out a piece of gold that the pirates are looking for and it's actually in the shape of a cross. And, uh, you know, as they're boarding up, trying to board up the door and whatnot, trying to save themselves. Uh, Father Malone takes it out and confronts the pirates with it. And then, again, another one of my favourite shots, the pirates just standing in the church, their eyes start glowing red. Uh, It it just looks incredible. And there's a confrontation scene. And it cuts in between more of that fantastic editing, cutting in between that and then Stevie on top of the lighthouse now trying to escape from the pirates. Um, One of them... Manages to stab her, but she's still going strong. We get to see a worm-faced pirate, which is the most we get to see of a pirate, actually. Yeah, and it's like what I said earlier. Um, to keep them faceless is for quite a few reasons. Yeah. So when we finally see that face, it's so effective. And it, it's just a few worms on um, sort of a green face. But it's very effective because that's the first and... Last yeah, time yeah, we it is. see it, it is, which makes that more impactful, and we're sort of like, oh shit, maybe it could be Stevie because at this point we're we're five deaths down. Yeah, there's only one left, you know, and um, we don't know who it's gonna be. We've got all our key players in the firing line, so when you know we see this ghost pirate up close. For the first time, we're like, hmm, maybe it is Stevie, who we've, who me personally has connected the most with in yeah. the film. Yeah, absolutely. She's a very likable character. And the things, that's what I found about this film, a lot of the characters are likable. Yeah, yeah. She, it, she's probably the most developed, yeah, if I'm going to be she honest. She is, she is. But I mean, there's no one really to hate. And I think that's why the stakes feel so high in it as well. Yeah. Don't really want any of these characters to get killed. Yeah, it's true. And especially when they pick off the babysitter, who is a lovable character, who, you know, didn't do, hasn't done any wrong. She's really nice, you know. And then when she gets killed, that sort of makes you realise, shit, no one's really safe. Uh, I disagree slightly with that. And I'll, I'll probably come on to it in our conclusion. Okay. Yeah. But um, after we see the worm-faced pirate, uh, the pirate in the church, the one with the red eyes, grabs the cross that the uh, priest is holding. And that basically stop, puts a stop to everything. Um, so you think it, uh, it glows up and every, all the pirates disappear, the fog disappears. Uh, we get a scene of the fog disappearing, going back, rolling back. And... Uh, just when you think it's finished, we get a shot of Father Malone in the church and the pirates appear again and it's a hard cut to the ending as he gets decapitated. Yeah, so he so Father Malone is, is the one throughout the film that feels the residual guilt from what happened a hundred years ago. It was his great grandfather that was part of it. And at the end, he realises the gold that was stolen was melted and made into this cross. I don't see what the point of stealing it was if you're not, if you're not going to use it for anything or spend it on anything, but whatever. And uh, so he's the one that feels this residual guilt. So at the end, he's going to sacrifice himself, give back the gold. I mean, you know, Tom Atkins pulls him away and when the gold, you know, is being handed over. So they don't take Father Malone with it as well. And then everything seems fine. You know, Stevie's saved because the ghost pirates have gone. She gives a little, you know, speech, a little monologue at the end to, to sort of round up the film. And you're like, oh, everyone's safe. Everyone's good. And then Father Malone eventually gets killed. Yeah. And, you know, gets decapitated. It, it happens off screen, though, doesn't it? You know, yeah. They seem up. Great ending, though. Yeah, great ending. Yeah. And, and that idea of, you know, it was actually Father Malone's fate, that it, it would be him. That would 
and in his eyes and uh, in the pirates both pirates eyes it was him that should and you know be killed so yeah so they can they said six were gonna go six went yeah fantastic film it five stars for me it just does its job to a high level and it's scary. It is still scary now. The matter of times you rewatch it, very effective. Thoughts? Yeah. No. Conclusion? I, I really enjoyed the film, and um, I think soundtrack, atmosphere, cinematography, acting, all you know, sublime. Really, really, really well done. The plot for me. And the story is where it's a little iffy. And it had mixed reviews at the time. And it's become a cult classic now. But one of the biggest bugbears for for people, and for me as well. And, you know, I'm picking at straws here, um, essentially. But a lot of the feedback was knowing that six people were going to be killed. Knowing that, sort of, almost from the start of the film, you know, that the plot is around six people. Three of them are killed, you know, initially. They're our first kills. Only one of them has any sort of impact on any of the characters. Yeah? And then you have the dead body that comes from that as well. Then you have Charles Cypher, who wasn't a big part of the film, really. He's just the pervy weatherman that calls her up. You know, there's no real connection there. And... Then it's the babysitter who isn't the biggest character. In, you know, she's not one of our key players. She's not one of the, 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 the big cast members. So I think a lot of people thought that it took a bit of a cheap way out. But I then think. to counter with that, it also leaves a bit of mystery there as to who was going to get killed. Yeah. It, and even though the people that get killed isn't the most satisfying, it's still... Maybe the payoff wasn't... Yeah, yeah. What it maybe could have been. I mean, if you'd... Jamie Lee Curtis doesn't have the biggest role in this film. No. If you'd killed her off, it would have been quite effective. Yeah. Because we have that connection to Jamie Lee Curtis as an actress. Yeah. You know, people would have been familiar with Halloween. And people would have been familiar with Charles Cyphers, though. Yeah, but his... Yeah, but his character's not... In this film, wasn't that big. It wasn't an important character. I know Jamie Lee Curtis wasn't in the film much, but there was more of a connection to her. Yeah. And I, th- I think the feedback was that people, you know, it sort of took away from it a little bit from them not sort of going there. But then, you know, that's maybe just picking at straws because everything else in the film is, is exceptionally good. Yeah. So that's it. That's the fog. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, did I, uh, yeah, did I fuck go up, on too much? <laughs> no, Sorry. I didn't. Sorry. That's, that's absolutely shit. fine. No, <laughs> you, uh, yeah, no, you raised some good points. I never really looked at it like that before. But that is this week's episode done. Yes. And next week is your choice. What are we talking about? So next week is my choice. <laughs> Do you know what you're talking about? Oh my about? God, I can't remember. <laughs> What the fuck are we talking about? We're talking about sleepaway camp next oh, week. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> yes. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, yes, sleepaway camp. Fantastic slasher film. I can't wait to go way too in-depth about that as I have the fog. Yes. Um, but yeah. Yeah, very excited for sleepaway camp. Yeah. So, that's it. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. Absolutely. If you are listening on Podbean or SoundCloud, give us a like and a follow. And if you enjoy what you're, li- what you're hearing, then uh, give us a share. Tell your friends about us. Yeah, and give, give us your opinions on The Fog as well. Yeah. I mean, Gary, Gary loves it, 10 out of 10. I loved it as well. Maybe not so much. I, I hope we've brought some ideas up for discussion, so let us yeah. know. Yeah, I, I, we know, we already know you guys love it, but, um, you know, give some thoughts on what happens in the film and the whole six deaths things that, you know, Chris brought up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, speaking of which, give us a uh, like on social media and follow on there as well. We're on uh, Horror Court Trash over Facebook and Instagram, Horror Court Trash on Twitter. I am Gazmo205 on Instagram, GazCruise92 on, tw- on Twitter. I am Chris Barker eight two three on Instagram and Twitter. 
And that is it. So we will see you the same time, same place again next week. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.